Tainan Portillo presents Featuring the best horror stories of the 19th century Welcome to the Po Show Podcast Narrated by Tainan Portillo Today's episode, excerpts from the book House of Bondage by Octavia Rogers Albert. Hey everyone, and happy Black History Month. I wanted to do an episode that helped celebrate Black History Month, so I looked for some classical literature from Black and African American authors, and I stumbled upon this one, which details the personal stories of former slaves in Louisiana. It was published in 1890, one year after the author's death, and Octavia herself was a former slave, freed after the American Civil War, and attended Atlanta University to become a teacher. She was dedicated to educating children and people who were formerly enslaved and never given an education before. Her book is a compilation of stories of people who were former slaves, and the influence that religion and education had on their lives before and after their freedom. It was also very hard for me to find a copy. It didn't come up as a result in almost any of my searches, and it wasn't on Amazon. I couldn't find it anywhere, which actually made me want to find it even more because it seems to be a a more rare resource. Now, for the sake of respecting these stories and the real people involved Uh, and of accounting the true history of slavery in America. I am not going to be acting out these excerpts as I usually do. I will introduce new characters and topics and just read straight from the book. To start, an excerpt from the introduction to the book, written by Willard F. Malaliu. The story of slavery never has been and never will be fully told. It is because American slavery was the vilest that ever saw the sun that it is and will remain forever impossible to adequately portray its unspeakable horrors, its heartbreaking sorrows, its fathomless miseries of hopeless grief, its intolerable shames, and its heaven-defying and outrageous brutalities. But while it remains true that the story can never be completely told, it is wise and well that the task should be attempted, and in part performed, and this for the reason that there are some who presume that this slavery, the vilest that ever saw the sun, has been and is still of divine appointment. In short, that from first to last it was a divine institution, It is well to remind all such people that the almighty ruler of the universe is not an accessory, either before or after the fact, to such crimes as were involved in slavery. Let no guilty man, let no descendant of such man, attempt to excuse the sin and shame of slaveholding on the ground of its providential character. The truth is that slavery is the product of human greed and lust and oppression and not of God's ordering. Then it is well to write about slavery that the American people may know from what depths of disgrace and infamy they rose, when guided by the hand of God, they broke every yoke and let the oppressed go free. This volume, penned by a hand that now rests in the quiet of the tomb, is a contribution to the sum total of the story that can never be entirely told. Now an excerpt from Chapter 1, Charlotte Brooks. None but those who resided in the South during the time of slavery can realize the terrible punishments that were visited upon the slaves. Virtue and self-respect were denied them. It was in the fall of 1879 that I met Charlotte Brooks. She was brought from the state of Virginia and sold in the state of Louisiana many years before the war. I have spent hours with her, listening to her telling of her sad life of bondage in the cane fields of Louisiana. 
She was always willing to speak of old master and mistress. I remember one morning as she entered my home, I said to her, Good morning, Aunt Charlotte. How are you feeling today? She said, My child, I didn't sleep hardly last night. My poor old bones ached me so bad I could not move my hand for a while. What's the cause of it? Why, old master used to make me go out before day in high grass and heavy dews, and I caught cold. I lost all of my health. I tell you, nobody knows the trouble I have seen. I have been sold three times. I had a little baby when my second master sold me, and my last old master would make me leave my child before day to go to the cane field, and he would not allow me to come back till ten o'clock in the morning to nurse my child. When I did go, I could hear my poor child crying long before I got to it, and my poor child would be so hungry when I'd get to it. Sometimes I would have to walk more than a mile to get to my child, and when I did get there, I would be so tired I'd fall asleep while my baby was sucking. He did not allow me much time to stay with my baby when I did go to nurse it. Sometimes I would overstay my time with my baby, then I would have to run all the way back to the field. Oh, I tell you, nobody knows the trouble we poor colored folks had to go through with here in Louisiana. I had heard people say Louisiana was a hard place for black people, and I didn't want to come. But old master took me and sold me from my mother anyhow, and from my sisters and brothers in Virginia. I have never seen or heard from them since I left old Virginia. That's been more than 35 years ago. When I left old Virginia, my mother cried for me, and when I saw my poor mother with tears in her eyes, I thought I would die. Sometimes when I was away off in the cane field at work, it seemed I could hear my mother singing the old ship of Zion. I could never hear any of the old Virginia hymns sung here, for everybody was Catholic around where I stayed. I just thought if I could get back to my old Virginia home to hear some of my mother's old-time praises, it would do my soul good. But poor me, I could never go back to my old Virginia home. Now an excerpt from chapter 2, where Charlotte Brooks meets another slave sold from Virginia to Louisiana. Her name is Jane Lee. How do you do, Aunt Jane? She said, How do you know me, child? I said, I heard you just came from Virginia. I came from that state too. i just been out here four years. I am so glad to see you, Aunt Jane. Where did you come from in Virginia? I came from Richmond. I have left all of my people in Virginia. Aunt Jane was no kin to me, but I felt that she was, because she came from my old home. Me and Aunt Jane talked and cried that Sunday evening till nearly dark. Aunt Jane said she left her children, and it almost killed her to ever think of them. She said one was only five years old. Her old master got in debt, and he sold her to pay his debts. I told her I had left all of my people too, and that I was a poor lone creature to myself when I first came out from Virginia. Aunt Jane asked me, did the people have churches here? I told her no, that I had not been in a church since I came here. She had religion, and she was as good a woman as you ever saw. She could read the Bible, and could sing so many pretty hymns. Aunt Jane said it seemed to her she was lost, because she could not go to church and hear preaching and singing like she used to hear in Virginia. She said people didn't care for Sunday in Louisiana. It was dark when I left Aunt Jane, but before I left her house, she prayed and sang, and it made me feel glad to hear her pray and sing. It made me think of my old Virginia home and my mother. She sang, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I had heard that hymn before, but had forgot it. All next week, it seemed to me I could hear the old Virginia hymn Aunt Jane sung for me that Sunday evening when I was working in the cane field. I finally got religion, and it was Aunt Jane's praying and singing them old Virginia hymns that helped me so much. Aunt Jane's master would let her come to see me sometimes, but not often. 
Sometimes she would slip away from her place at night and come to see me anyhow. She would hold prayer meeting in my house whenever she would come to see me. Would your master allow you to hold prayer meeting on his place? No, my child. If old master heard us singing and praying, he would come out and make us stop. One time I remember we all were having a prayer meeting in my cabin, and master came up to the door and hollered out, You Charlotte, what's all that fuss in there? We all had to hush up for that night. I was so afraid old master would see Aunt Jane. I knew Aunt Jane would have to suffer if her white people knew she was off at night. Master used to say God was tired of us all hollering to him at night. Did any of the black people on his place believe in the teachings of their master? No, my child. None of us listened to him about singing and praying. I tell you, we used to have some good times together praying and singing. He did not want us to pray, but we would have our little prayer meeting anyhow. Sometimes when we met to hold our meetings, we would put a big wash tub full of water in the middle of the floor to catch the sound of our voices when we sung. When we all sung, we would march around and shake each other's hands, and we would sing easy and low so Master could not hear us. Oh, how happy I used to be in those meetings, although I was a slave. I thank the Lord Aunt Jane Lee lived by me. She helped me to make my peace with the Lord. Oh, the day I was converted, it seemed to me it was a paradise here below. It looked like I wanted nothing anymore. Jesus was so sweet to my soul. Aunt Jane used to sing, Jesus, the name that charms our fears. That hymn just suited my case. Sometimes I felt like preaching myself. It seemed I wanted to ask everybody if they loved Jesus when I first got converted. I wanted to ask Old Master, but he was Creole and did not understand what I said much. Aunt Jane was the cause of so many on our plantation getting religion. We did not have any church to go to, but she would talk to us about Old Virginia, how people done there. She said them beads and crosses we saw everybody have was nothing. She said people must give their hearts to God, to love Him and keep His commandments, and we believed what she said. I never wanted them beads I saw others have, for I just thought we would pray without anything and that God only wanted the heart. Now an excerpt from chapter 4 about a fair-skinned slave. Her name was Nellie Johnson. Aunt Jane loved Nellie, although Nellie was no kin to her, and she used to talk very often to me about her white people using her so bad. She said once that a baby was born to Nellie on the road when she was coming in the speculators drove and the speculator gave the child away to a white woman nearby where they camped that night. The speculator said they could not take care of the child on the road and told Nellie it was better to let the white woman have the child. So many poor colored people are dead from grieving at the separation of their children that was sold away from them. Aunt Jane said Nellie's owner was so bad. She said they had a man named Sam Wilson he stayed one half of his time in the swamp. His master used to get after him to whip him, but Sam would not let his master beat him. He would run off and stayed in the woods two and three months at a time. The white folks would set the dogs behind him, but Sam could not be caught by the dogs. The colored people said Sam greased his feet with rabbit grease, and that kept the dogs from him. Aunt Jane said to me that she did not know what Sam used, but it looked like Sam could go off and stay as long as he wanted when the white folks got after him. From this same chapter, we have an excerpt talking about two slaves who were married but lived on different plantations. Their names are Richard and Betty. Richard used to be mighty faithful to his prayer meetings, but old master began to be mighty mean to him. His wife lived on another plantation, and master told Richard he had to give up that wife and take a woman on our place. Richard told Old Master he did not want any other woman. He said he loved his wife and could never love any other woman. His wife was named Betty. I believe Richard would die for Betty, 
Sometimes Richard would slip off and go to see Betty, and Master told the patrollers every time they caught Richard on the plantation where Betty lived to beat him half to death. The patrollers had caught Richard many times and had beat him mighty bad. So one night Richard heard the dogs coming in the woods near his wife's house and he jumped out of his wife's window and he went for dear life or death through the woods. He said he had to always pass over the bayou to go to his wife. But that night the patrollers were so hot behind him that he lost his way. He had a skiff he always went over in, but he forgot about the skiff when they were after him. Richard said he just took off every piece of clothes he had on and tied them around his neck and swam across the bayou. He lost his hat and went without any all day in the field. Richard said when he got to the bayou he was wet with sweat and it was one of the coldest nights he had ever felt in Louisiana. He said he had about two miles to go after he got over the bayou and when he got across he just slipped on his clothes he had around his neck and ran every step of the way to his own plantation. Sometimes they would catch Richard and drive four stakes in the ground, and they would tie his feet and hands to each one and beat him half to death. I tell you, sometimes he could not work. Master did not care, for he had told Richard to take some of our women for a wife. But Richard would not do it. Richard loved Betty and he would die for her. Next, an excerpt from chapter 10 about a slave who was separated from his family as well. His name was Uncle John. My wife in Georgia was named Nancy. She got religion while the minister was preaching. I had religion before my wife did. Nancy had been praying for a long time. She used to go away off in the woods to pray, I went in the woods many times to pray. I thought I could pray better in the swamp. Uncle John said, I remember until this day the text that minister took that Sunday when Nancy got religion. It was, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I tell you, ma'am, Nancy shouted and was so happy we could hardly get her home that evening. She shouted all along the road as we walked. We all got happy on our way back that night, and I do believe it was 10 o'clock before we reached home. Nancy cried out in church when she was converted and said, Glory be to God and the Lamb forever. I am washed clean by the blood of Jesus. Uncle John said, Poor Nancy. I reckon she is dead now. She was our white folks' cook. We had a little girl, 10 years old. She waited in the house. They would blindfold her and beat my poor child half to death. I tell you, my heart would bleed sometimes when I'd see how my child was treated. I could do nothing for my wife and children. I was not allowed to open my mouth. Uncle John could hardly suppress the tears from his eyes while relating the sad condition of his wife and the inhuman abuse of his daughter when he left them in Georgia although it had been many years. He said, Oh, if I could only see my children once more. From this same chapter, we have an excerpt talking about a slave who had asked his priest to pray for his freedom. He was one of Aunt Lorendo's cousins. Aunt Lorendo, when you were a Catholic, did you always confess everything to the priest? Yes, ma'am. I'd tell the priest everything I did wicked. But, I tell you, one time I had a cousin that told the priest he wanted to get free and asked him to pray to God to set him free. And bless your soul, ma'am, the priest was about to have my cousin hung. The priest told my cousin's master about it, and they was talking strong about hanging my cousin. They had my cousin up and made him tell who had told him anything about freedom. But the priest managed some way to save my poor cousin. Madam, I tell you, from that day on, I could not follow my Catholic religion like I had. You know the Catholics always tell the priest everything. They talk to him like a father. 
and so it was with my cousin. He would tell the priest everything. He never thought he would tell on him. Finally, an excerpt explaining the trials of a woman named Hattie. Aunt Lorendo replied, We come through so much hardship, sometimes I wonder why we did not all die out in slave time. They used to run away in the woods and stay till all the clothes was off their backs. Why, ma'am, I know one time, right in my neighborhood, one woman, her mistress always had the overseer beating her. Her name was Hattie. She used to run away and live in the woods for three and four weeks at a time. I remember I was out in the field hoeing cane in slave time, and as I was getting toward the end of my row of cane, I heard somebody over the fence in the woods calling me, and at first I did not know what to do. But as I looked up through the fence, I saw it was Hattie. Madam, if you believe me, Hattie was almost naked that day. She asked me to give her something to eat, and I did give her all I had in my bucket. Hattie said, Lorendo, I had my child here in the woods. It is dead, and I buried it in a piece of my frock shirt. I said, Hattie, how in the world did you do by yourself? She said, I don't know, Lorendo. All I can tell, God took care of me in these woods. Oh, she said, I have so many trials with my mistress. I try to satisfy her, but nothing I do pleases her. I left my home, I reckon, two months. I tore all my clothes off of me. See, I am almost naked. I said, Hattie, why did you run away? Because, Lorendo, she said, Old mistress came up to me one morning and went to beating me with a big iron key all over my head, and I tell you she almost gave me a fit. I give her one hard slap and left her. I knowed master would almost kill me, and I left for the woods before he came home. I asked Aunt Lorendo if Hattie had a husband. She said no, that Hattie had two children by her master's son and she reckoned that one Hattie had given birth to in the woods was by his son, too. Hattie wanted to get married to one of the men on the place, but the master would not let her because he wanted her for his son. Well, Aunt Lorendo, what finally became of Hattie? The patrollers at last caught her with the hounds one day when we was all coming out in the field, and we met poor Hattie. They had caught her that morning, Madam, I remember just like it was yesterday. There was six white men and ten hounds. All the white men was on horses, and poor Hattie was in front barefoot, the dogs behind her. Hattie was almost naked that morning. Blood was all on her feet as she was walking along. I saw all of it with my own two eyes. Oh, how sorry I felt for poor Hattie. I heard when they got her home, her master put her in stocks every night and would beat her every morning. Hattie at last died from punishment, I believe. Now, my readers, these are not imaginary thoughts, but they were actually related to me. While I pen these lines, I can hardly suppress the tears when I picture to my mind a poor woman marching before six men six horses, and ten bloodhounds with blood oozing from her feet. There were none to care for her or give a friendly word in her behalf. Poor creature, she had given birth to a child in the woods, being compelled to wander about like a wild beast in the forest on account of the inhuman treatment of the white man in this Bible land of ours. Just you imagine the poor creature, a precious soul in the sight of God, no doubt, this temple of the living God being driven by bloodhounds, bruised and mangled as she marched before them. And with all that, she was carried home and put in stocks at night and beaten every morning. On being asked how she got on in the woods without any human help, she said, I don't know. All I can tell you, God took care of me.
I, for one, am very grateful to Octavia for having the the dedication and the foresight to pen these stories and to tell us all of the horrors of slavery and the atrocities so that we may never allow them to happen again. Uh, that's all I have time for right now, but if you guys would like to hear more from this book, email poshopod at gmail.com or leave a comment on the Posho YouTube channel and let me know because uh, this book explores further experiences, um, things with the KKK, with Jim Crow laws, and, and much more, and I would be honored to share more of that history with you. Now, I wanted to examine some of the things in these excerpts, especially the emphasis which Aunt Charlotte and Octavia uh, place upon education and religion. It's obvious that they both want freed slaves and future generations of African Americans to have upright characters, noble morals, and the ability to compete fairly and provide for themselves in society. It reminds me of Joe Louise Clark and the movie based on his actions in cleaning up Eastside High School, Lean on Me. It's a fantastic film with Mar uh, Morgan Freeman. And uh, according to Joe Clark, that film is 95% accurate. There is obviously a great importance placed upon education, educating and, and being able to bring to African Americans who did not have knowledge the ability to have knowledge. And um, I think it's very important uh, nowadays to emphasize knowledge in general. I mean, we see where wherever uh, in different communities whether they be minority communities or not, um, where schools suffer, so do the children. Where schools suffer, so do the growing adults. And we get this horrible cycle of not having a safe learning environment or a proper learning environment for children. And they don't learn, they don't want to learn, they don't have motivation to learn. In fact, they see all around them that their future will only lead to the same place. And it's very interesting to read in this piece of classical literature that came from 1890 the importance that Octavia as the author is placing upon family, upon raising children right, upon having good moral structures, and upon education. Um, of course, her mor morals are more placed upon religion, but it, it, it is shown that no matter where in the community children uh, come from and grow up, if that child has a good family structure, if they have had morals guide them in their decisions, and if they have had a proper education, those children can change their future. They can change their future. They can change the future for their parents. It is extremely important. I think of things that Denzel Washington has said before where, where he says, it begins in the home. He talks about how there are many households that don't have fathers and the boys in those households look for male role models and many times turn to improper examples and get led down the wrong path. I, I think about my own personal life because uh, my father abused my mother and she divorced him only for me to protect me. She tells me this all the time, um, which breaks my heart that she wouldn't do it for herself, but... Uh, she divorced him and was a single mother for a long time. And she is the strongest woman that I have ever known. Her, her family was not even there to support her. Um, essentially, her father said, no, you made this bed, now sleep in it. Um, she had no help. She was on her own. She did not know where my next diapers were going to come from. But she knew that I needed a positive male role model in my life. And she eventually remarried. And as my birth father got visitation rights and I saw him, I was able to see the, the juxtaposition between my stepfather and my mother and my birth father. They're very different lifestyles. I won't go into too much detail, but I am so glad to have my stepfather as my role model. He has taught me what it means to be a man, how to handle your emotions, how to handle stress. He has inspired me in so many ways that uh, I can't even count and that he probably doesn't even know um, have affected me in my life. And I'm sorry, I'm getting a little, uh, <laughs> a little 
<clears throat> lump in my throat, but um, he has taught me what it is to be a man and healthy ways to express masculinity, vulnerability, and I, I love him and I love my mother for picking such an amazing man. Uh, so I just think that it's relevant. I think that it's, it's uh, very interesting to see that even in classical literature, um, Octavia here is placing such a major importance upon strong families and keeping children safe and, and raising children and emphasizing the importance of strong moral fiber and education. Anyway, uh, that is all that I have for you uh, as of this moment. I hope that the excerpts and real stories of Charlotte and George and Hattie and everyone that we learned of today have all granted us a greater understanding of what slavery was actually like. Now, just to inform you all, the next episode of the Poe Show will be The Dunwich Horror by H.P. Lovecraft. Another podcast actually collaborated with me on this episode. It was the co-hosts of That Was Horrible. Now, we had a great time uh, recording this episode. It was a ton of fun, and uh, it was also very long. So the next episode is actually going to be separated into three parts. But the first part will be going live very soon after this episode, so stick around for that. Anyway, uh, happy Black History Month, and I suppose you'll hear from me again in the next episode on The Poe Show.